Good evening, everyone. Yeah, so I have a few questions for you before I uh, you know, start the discussion with my panelists. Um, I want to start off with asking how many of you remember watching uh, television channels when they were less than five? Raise your hands. Okay, a few of us. Okay, a few of us. Okay. Uh, do you remember the ads that played that at that point in time? I do. Yeah, I do. Raise your hands. Show me your hands who all remember. Okay. How many of you uh, remember watching channels when uh, they were about 20 odd, 20 to 30? Few. Okay, yeah, obviously excluding us, like, okay, 20 to 30. And how many of you are on social media now? Yeah? Everybody, raise hands. Who's not on social media? <laughs> okay. How many of you have uh, posted ever a picture or video of yourself on social media? All of us, right? Uh, how many of you still watch ads? Okay, lots. Encouraging. <laughs> okay, that's encouraging. Uh, you know, the point that I'm really making is this one point in time, and you know, when I said how many uh, less remember watching channels when they were less than five, uh, gives away our age. We all like uh, in our 40s, and the others who raise their hand, the few there are in their 30s, and all the others in this room are youngsters I can see. And I think brand marketing has made a huge shift uh, since we uh, started. You know, uh, and the shift really that has happened is uh, there was one point where marketeers would craft their stories and uh, would take a lot of pain in telling their stories in a very elegant manner. From there to now, uh, what happens is often we discover brands on maybe um, Instagram, uh, we read reviews about it maybe on a marketplace like Amazon or Flipkart or maybe a TripAdvisor, uh, we'll go and maybe watch a YouTube video on it somewhere. And uh, then very often, we are also happy to give our own point of view on our experience with that brand, right? Lots of us have sent um, not so good tweets about brands and messages to them, etc. But we do participate in how we feel about a brand as well. And I think that poses um, a real complex problem for marketeers, right? Um, so, you know, today brands are getting discovered uh, through fellow consumers and uh, they're sort of uh, per perpetuating the buying process, right? It's been uh, completely changed. So in that context, I want to start off with you, Pallavi, and ask you that as a brand, how do you handle this uh, complex uh, system? What is the playbook that a brand should have to navigate this complex system? Hi, everyone. Um, already introduced to you, Pallavi. Uh, I work with HRX, and thank you, Rubina, for that uh, solid opening. I mean, I, I think it just gets us thinking a lot more about as marketeers and brand creators. Um, since I'm the first one and I'm doing the opening, I'm just taking a step back and getting into a uh, slightly academic discussion about brand creation, right, and what is a brand. Um, if you look at the process of brand creation as marketeers, I would broadly classify it into three stages, right? One is the creation of the brand, which is not just a logo creation, but you have to create a bunch of raw material which you're gonna shoot at your consumer, and it's the perception they will start uh, generating as an outcome of what you shoot out to them. So brand essentially is an outcome, right? It's not just a logo or a device. Second stage would be the amplification. Um, TV, Instagram, social media, direct marketing, whatever you sort of start using, the vehicle or the, or the carrier of your message becomes the amplification media. And at some point in time, we get into the transformative exercise of the brand. But I, I think what makes a solid brand, um, and which is the most important point in the playbook of brand creation, would be the underlying factor to all of these things, right? When we were in college, we kind of discovered something called a brand personality. I mean, you try drawing a pen picture of who your consumer is going to be, how your brand tone would look like, how your brand will speak to this consumer. I, again, sort of drill it down to another uh, level of detailing, saying not just personality, but what makes a brand brand. Um, and makes it resilient, something that can withstand the, the times and, and the uncertainties of time and the 
uh, abrupt changes which happens is the character of the brand. Character, drilling down to the character of a brand is a painstaking exercise. It doesn't happen in one go. I'm a fitness brand and I often give this analogy saying if you look at a sports person or if you talk about Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule, anything for it to become successful and solid takes that much amount of time. So even a brand needs to be consistent with its character, with the message which is in sync with its character and keep harping on it. Like a sports person or a fitness enthusiast does the same drill every day to arrive at a level of expertise which is surpassable. Sometimes when you become better at it, you even break it down to a micro level. Take the same analogy to brand building. You have to work on the building blocks bit by bit on a daily basis. So if I'm a fitness brand, I keep talking to the same guy saying, hey, I'm a fitness brand. I don't, I don't necessarily talk the language of a product saying, buy me. But I talk to him and I converse to him saying, I'm a fitness brand, this is what I do for you, this is what my character is, I'm honest, this is the change I'm trying to bring about, I'm trying to buddy up with you. And this message remains consistent over a period of time. So the character is what creates resilience in that brand and that resilience is something which will help you sustain even a pandemic. Brands which were just a label, which didn't have that resilience, which didn't have that character, unfortunately we all are familiar with such sad stories, they fizzled out. Some withstood. Again, taking off from uh, heyday examples, if you look at a brand like Colgate, everyone in this room can associate Colgate with an imagery of white sparkling teeth, right? If you talk about Lux, everyone can probably remember Filmi Sitaro Ka Sabun. And how many times have you seen these commercials? Like how many times on different faces, different media, different channel? Well, they've been made to become resilient over a period of time and that's how they have survived. To me, the playbook, the most important thing is identify the character of that brand and keep at it. Keep at it till you reach a stage where it becomes synonymous to the reaction you're expecting from your consumer. Does that, does that make sense? <laughs> No, uh, that's amazing, uh, Pallavi, and what you said is so true. And just building on what you said, I want to go to you, Puneet, and ask you that, you know, well, what Pallavi said is, um, is so important for any brand to build its character and be resilient and keep saying it over and over again till uh, people understand the brand personality, the brand character. It's very important. But how do you do it in today's day and age? Because you don't have so much control, like I said in my opening remarks, you don't have as a marketer so much control abo about um, what a consumer is going to say about your brand. So we are in a stage, uh, I believe what I call, you know, we all started in this age of storytelling. Today, it's more like story creating, story living along with uh, the consumer. So how do you make your brand uh, consistent, resilient, and so that people can still understand the character of the brand uh, with all the noise that's happening around it? Uh, I think today uh, consumers need, feel the need to be connected with the brand for them to engage with the brand. Uh, there is this book by uh, Jeffrey Samuels which talks about how do you turn consumer passion points into marketing opportunities. Uh, and I also feel the, the most memorable interactions that consumers have with brand is when the subject is about their passion point, right? Now for, for, uh, for us, uh, this is when, when there's a memorable interaction between the consumer and the brand, that is when the consumer feels deeply connected with the product and service and understands what the brand stands for, which is the crux and the core of what marketeers are looking for. Now at MasterCard, we have identified nine passion points uh, across geographies, from travel to culinary, from fashion to health, from sports to music, and these passion points obviously keep changing across different demographics and geography. And uh, this has become a pillar for us, for every sponsorship or a priceless program, but we call it internally framework, right? And we have not stopped at that. Uh, we today have also started something called as multi-sensory marketing. Like for example, uh, we, have a, uh, we have our MasterCard Sonic Sound. Now, typically brands use the Sonic identity to just slap it as a MoGo on the end slate. But what we're doing is that we have created a deep level of brand identity from a Sonic level, which enables us to collaborate with musicians, with composers around the world and renowned ones at it to create popular music, hence the brand becomes part of popular culture. 
We have recently launched our flagship culinary experience. Uh, we very soon are going to launch uh, a premium line of perfume with an iconic brand. Uh, in India, for example, last year in December, uh, we are sponsors of uh, the biggest fashion point in this country, which is cricket. Uh, we've, we've, we've managed to pivot a campaign, uh, primarily to promote women in sports. Uh, and uh, how do you build gender equality on and off the ground? And that was recently concluded uh, with the fact of creating a sports clinic for aspiring women cricketers where we have gotten legendary cricketers to mentor them. And now this is an ongoing plan which, is, uh, which we intend to continue. Now if you look at all the examples which I have sh shown and all of them have given us a remarkable uh, response in terms of impact and engagement. Now each one of them have a strong purpose uh, which is based on a passion point. And uh, it not only enables us to build uh, richer storytelling formats, but also enables consumers to reach out to us in different ways other than the, your typical traditional ways, which typically most brands do. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I think it's an interesting point what you brought uh, forward. Uh, what you're really trying to say is that you're uh, trying to be part of the pop culture in many different segments, uh, which is a little bit, um, you know, expanded from your just uh, truly your business uh, to be able to consistently, to Pallavi's point, build stories still around them and encourage people to build stories around that area. I think works uh, beautifully and as you were speaking, I was thinking of some of the things that MasterCard's done and yes, it did resonate with me as a consumer as well. Uh, but Deepak, moving to you next, I want to ask you that, uh, like Puneet was saying that, you know, they're doing something for somebody who's perhaps a sports lover, they're doing something for uh, another person who's a culinary, uh, you know, uh, has a culinary interest while there may be another person who's interested in travel and they or in music and uh, you know they're engaging with them at another level how do you master this whole experience on digital and bring it out still in a unified way uh, that the brand still is center stage how does one do that okay uh, interesting um, uh, that's a loaded question you know um, uh, so i i think uh, one interesting thing um, in marketing which is happening because of the way people are connected, digitally connected, I would say that now the, the feedback loop, you know, or the kind of signals which you can pick from consumers have increased multifold. Yeah. So back in the day you would say that, listen, I'm, I'm relying on certain signals. If I was relying on probably some research or some insights, I put out some panel data out there, I, I, I go to a research agency and I probably learn something about my customers out there. So what has really shifted significantly is now that the, the amount of intelligence which can come to you, okay, is, can most times overwhelm you, okay. Um, uh, you know, so, but the good part about it is that at least it is coming to you, yeah. So yes, it is complex, but there are tools available out there which can simplify that complexity and make it manageable for you, yeah. Um, talking about, you know, um, Talking about, you know, Rubina's point that there are people who are showing some interest points. Yeah. And, and I would like to say, uh, draw an, uh, a journey out here. Uh, when there were platforms like Facebook which came into the market, um, when search came in, you know, search picked up signals which was around intent, Facebook came in around interest. Yeah. So you, suddenly the marketer saw that, okay, fine, my number of signals are increasing through these platforms. Uh, Fast track that to today and fast track that as we are going to go forward for the next two, three years. Another interesting signal is happening is that all of us in the room as consumers are most times leaving breadcrumbs of our digital transaction habits at lots of different places. Okay, so it's no more uh, at a stage or at a point where that information or that understanding is centralized or probably limited to a few platforms. Okay, so it's going to get more and more democratized. It's going to be out there, out there. Yeah, so, so tomorrow you may say, oh, there is shopping happening. So a platform like Amazon is capturing interest and behavior or transacting behavior of customers who are shopping into certain things. You end up going to a financial loan marketplace, they are able to profile you at a deeper level. So, you know, what I'm, you go to a D2C site, you are buying a range of product categories and there again that information is there across uh, across various behavior points, yeah. So by and large, there is going to be significant amount of intelligence out there. Uh, and there are tools which are out there which help you make sense out of it. 
yeah uh, so i would not I, at, in this conversation i would not spend too much time on the tools but there are tools out there i think as 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 a framework when you are looking to future proof your your brand and and one of the frameworks inside that narrative is that look uh, i should be, be i should become more and more hungry so that i can get i can uh, receive those signals yeah if i am able to be at a place where i am uh, i'm constantly listening through these you know i will sooner or later start making sense of how to apply those signals to my marketing objectives or to the kind of personas which i want to target and there one last point i would like to make here is that i don't think i think it's not about data it's not about technology it's about people and processes okay so if your people and teams have that mindset you know you will be able to there are tools and technologies which can simplify things yeah well, thanks nipak uh, very nicely put and you you know you try to simplify it thank you for doing that yeah but um, i totally agree with you that uh, you know you have to start collecting the data uh, making sense of it and seeing that how can you can build that whole uh, unifying experience uh, so that the brand voice is still not lost but lakshmi um, uh, coming to you and wanting to ask you uh, deepak said about people's and processes and so how do you work within the organization to one make sure that those people and that mind people mindset is there the process is followed and secondly you know uh, when it comes to technology which i know is a genuine problem you get thrown with so many partners doing so many different things right uh, how do you choose the right tools right partners um, how do you evaluate it and how do you uh, you know make those decisions uh, i think uh, first up i think one of the key things for a brand is to actually uh, travel along with consumers right and i think uh, beat in my earlier organization or even now one of the things i've realized is uh, one needs to actually be very true to the entire uh, life journey of a consumer and uh, when i say life journey uh, you know we are in the space of mobility uh, you know today one might be owning a two wheeler uh, probably even a car uh, but their personal evolution is is very steep uh, the aspiration levels of uh, of for the country today or every citizen is pretty pretty uh, high and uh, the moment the brand is able to kind of walk that particular journey i think it becomes easier for the brand to kind of relate to the consumer uh, and yes at some point in time picking a partner or you know was more of a decision of commerce right and at some point you know it was pure luck you know in my earlier organization uh, i just discovered uh, you know a few years back that uh, uh, you know one of the top advertisers of the country you know uh, the top creative head Uh, working and writing about a particular brilliant campaign you know har ghar kuch kehta hai was pure luck it was just a piece of scratch of paper and that was supposed to be rejected and it turned out to be the biggest hit ever so uh, yeah but but gone are those days you know you can have a very structured approach to it and i kind of discovered more than a decade back when i kind of walked in you know as a true blue sales guy into marketing and i said dhanda uh, dekha aur kya karna hai kar lenge right but then but then the evolution happened and that was the stage of discovery and i think in partner you will find many you have people from research from advertising uh, uh, from the brand world what not but what the brand should clearly look forward to is a very powerful custodian and uh, it takes time it's not easy uh, uh, but those custodians have very uh, very very uh, i would say a very nice knack of working with you right and what those custodians add to the brand is also very very significant Uh, in simple terms you know they have multiple zones uh, clearly one zone which says this is what the brand should do you know uh, there are certain zones okay you can do it but there are clear cut zones which says that you know this is not what the brand should do and uh, uh, you know when you work with consultants or anybody you know more of a tactical game uh, you're looking at the short term game and everything is 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 perfectly okay for you to work with but a custodian is very clear on the fact that what a brand should not do and i think that's the most important part Uh, for partners i think be it any world be it advertising brand or any space uh, uh, working with a custodian and identifying them is uh, is super cru crucial for the success uh, and i personally remember and uh, coincidentally it was in this very same room a decade back uh, you know i didn't get the world of design and decor you know and uh, uh, patiently i remember the team that i worked with uh, uh, these custodians were very clear in kind of saying that we will not take a business brief from you okay we want a design brief and we will only work on a design brief from you and they made me run around the country for a month and a half 
and then it i was in a position to kind of give a a a, a, a true design brief with clear cut inspiration and then we had a whole set of you know a, a range of things come up, come alive so uh, i think that's the world of custodians and uh, uh, they exist everywhere i mean they exist in the world of advertising i mean you suddenly find custodians with even the world of production houses i mean you work with certain directors they really get the brand right and and that's important for you and that's where you know uh, the quintessential relationship comes into picture because uh, uh, you know uh, and, and marketers come and go into brands but the custodians stay right and the custodians actually over decades carry that particular legacy and it's not just a function of brands which have legacy it's also about brands which which are just new born right you can have a world of uh, you know different points of view come in different perspectives come in and i think that's the charm of building a brand because you know uh, and and today if uh, even see it for that matter right uh, see it was not built over the last 2 years right there are hundreds of people and the associations with each of these partners have lasted so long that uh, there is a story or two that everyone is able to share and i think that's the that's the charm of building a future proof brand because you know you have uh, trust and you can definitely you know rely on those partners and uh, for everyone out there every marketer please find your custodian that's the only thing i would kind of say wow so nicely put yeah that is so beautifully put I together guess. i'm a fan of this line i'm going to use it lakshmi and i just want to add to this i've been itching to add to this it's an anecdote i want to share we had a meeting a few days back and uh, it was me and my team and before i entered the room one round of introductions had already happened and then when i entered i started from the beginning and the client happened to turn around and say hey your version of your brand is very different from your team's version of your brand it was a eureka moment to realize that a win a victory happens when everyone from the ceo to the lowest denomination in the team can respond to the to a tweet in the same way in the same language yeah. that is when you have created a brand that's when you have kind of achieved coherence and you know that you've been consistently doing the same thing in the right way so i just wanted to uh, top it yeah. up with my Uh, thanks balavi that uh, to share that instant with such candor and luxury it was truly insightful i think all of us were listening ev to every single word that you were saying you know it's so important we get lost sometimes uh, in the commercials and just in we don't understand what brands are really looking for but yeah it's back to the basics look for custodians people you can trust because you're so rightfully said that you know people who think long term for the brand and tell you what is not uh good as much as they tell you what you should be doing you know so so important but thanks for sharing that with us uh shifting gears a little bit uh, now uh, through with you um can't uh, get away any panel these days without talking about throwing in words like data iot voice ar we are you know it's all disrupting us um and everybody gets really excited when you talk about it in uh uh panels but they also throws uh, a lot of um, challenges uh, right both innovations and challenges uh, to brands and it's not easy for brands to kind of uh, navigate through these upcoming consumer trends and create uh, interesting stories while leveraging these trends from your experience can you share some interesting brands that have done some interesting absolutely. work in that space absolutely rubin i think uh, what about lakshmi and all of us spoke about it definitely gave a glimpse of what's happening in the ecosystem and been in inmobi for for last 9 years and then you know seeing the global market i have what i've noticed the challenges and the trends what we're seeing globally they are almost same uh, inmobi which is a programmatic platform it you know connects to millions of uh, users out there uh, when we work with our north american customers take example of nike nobody can beat their brand communication story they are the best out there and they have been doing this for years now uh they work now for user acquisition strategies right and that's a paradigm shift uh because and and and, and the conversation which we are having with uh, nike you know that kind of uh, you know dwells towards uh, you know user acquisition and you know, how they can you know beat scan which are you know very very technical uh, stuff which is happening out there and it it just you know kind of gives you a glimpse of you know how brand marketers are kind of leveraging performance marketing on the other side uh, and you know which is uh, in mobis cons consumer platform which is glance and uh, so glance is kind of powering almost 225 million devices in india and indonesia at the moment uh, we are present in almost all the android phones out there right and we are partnering with all the largest oems out there so essentially what we are trying to simplify is the users journey to find the content 
I think the previous section when um, Saurav and Rishabh were talking about, you know, that we are in consumer uh, economy, content economy, uh, users' attention spans are very less. How do you simplify that content and, you know, kind of give it to users on one click, right? And that's the product philosophy of Glance, uh, you know, what we have built in last three to uh, three and a half years. Uh, so when a user is picking up the device, they're able to see the content and, you know, when they're getting into the indulge mode, they're able to do a lot of various things, you know, they're able to get news, they're able to play games, they're able to find live content, right? Uh, and what essentially is happening out there is we are trying to give users authentic content, right? Uh, because I've been hearing, uh, you know, for last two, two uh, sessions, there is so much of content out there, but which also brings a lot of owners on every marketer, every consumer, every platform what kind of content users are getting it? Are they getting authentic content? Because we all know we live uh, day in, day out, we see a lot of fake content out there, right? And, and this is what, you know, we, we have been, you know, uh, trying to experiment with Glance uh, uh, platform. We call it super engagement platform, right? Because there is so much of experiences and engagement which is happening out there. Consumers are able to find the content out there, right? So that is the product hypothesis. Uh, which we are building for consumers. Now coming to the brands, right? I'll take probably two examples how, uh, you know, um, two greatest brands out there are working with us and they have probably worked with us. One of them is Tata Tea, right? And uh, I think Tata Tea is there in India for the last 35 years. They're one of the iconic brands. Uh, if, I'm, if the numbers are correct, one in every three Indian consumers drink Tata Tea, right? Uh, and what campaigns they have been doing for last, I think, 12 to 13 years is a lot of campaigns which are related to social impact, right? Uh, uh, their property name is Jagore. Uh, and they have kind of touched upon all the social causes campaigns, right? Social impact campaigns. Uh, last year, they they've, you know, kind of worked with our creative team, our, our brand solutions team for climate change campaign, right? They wanted to kind of reach to millions of users telling, you know, like when you get up every day, uh, you, you are having your hot tea, do have that, but don't make the planet hot, right? Uh, and they did that on the consumer's lock screen because they were able to see the content and it kind of cut across every age group, right? Um, while, you know, I'm sure everybody sitting out here, we are all the privileged group, we're all having iPhones and all, but Android is probably, you know, 90% of what consumers are having in the country, right? It did create that impact with the consumers and I will not get into the matrices because it was a phenomenal campaign for Tata Tea. They were able to bring that communication of Jagore from television to mobile, right? And that's the trend what marketers are now trying to pick it up. They are trying to pick it up the platform which they have never tried before, right? Uh, Jagore has been always been a television and then they all moved to digital, but they figured it out. India being the mobile first country, we need to reach consumers on their mobile. That's one thing. Second brand, which is Swiggy, right? Which is, uh, we all know, it's a, they're doing a lot of very interesting campaigns and so far they have been doing a lot of user acquisition campaigns, right? But then they figured it out, game streaming is something which is picking up in the country, right? Lot of young population, which are in the age group of 18 to 24, they're watching, you know, streamers play the game. Uh, it took me some time to understand what it is, but then I understood this is what the new kick is, right? Uh, kids these days love watching, you know, uh, uh, somebody playing the games. And this is where Swiggy worked with us uh, because we have a massive game streaming uh, platform. Uh, 75 million users are there. And they did a lot of in-show integrations on there, right? They were able to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a lot of features, content related stuff and, 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 and all of that. So it just gives a very nice dichotomy of what's happening, right? Every brand is at a crossroad. Uh, Nike being in US, they are best at the content creation communication. They're trying to do user acquisition. Tata Tea, which is known in country for the last 35 years, uh, iconic brand, they're trying digital. Swiggy, you know, which is a very digital first uh, brand, they're trying gaming, they're trying brand campaigns. Right? And that's a very interesting thing, I think, um, and this is how market is kind of experimenting in the latest, uh, you know, uh, the marketing era. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think it's great that marketers are taking those risks, they're experimenting, they're trying new things, they're trying to stay relevant in the today's uh, day and age. And uh, Deepak, I want to ask you this question uh, that, you know, the uh, panel today we are on is about future-proofing uh, <coughs> your brand. So is it even required? I mean, do you need to adapt yourself to the changing environments or do you need to really future-proof yourself? And uh, if you do need to, what does it truly mean? 
Is there something called future proofing? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, there, 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 is, there is nothing called future proofing, at least in my belief. Yeah, um, I think, uh, which is why I said it's a, it's a very loaded uh, theme. But um, I think, you know, from my perspective, it gets down, Rubina, to that basic part that I think as a, as a team, I, I just would, you know, we're talking about, as a marketing function today, I would say that, okay, you know what, I have to manage messaging, I have to manage multiple channels, yeah, I have to manage uh, multiple marketing technologies, yeah. So there is, I, I need to orchestrate a lot of these things, okay. Uh, and I need to possibly orchestrate all these things, you know, very quickly in an agile manner. Um, then I need to also ensure that, you know what, I'm constantly having a team with me, okay, uh, which can evolve. Yeah. So there is a need to adapt, there is a need to evolve, and there is also a need to learn, unlearn. Okay. So, so honestly speaking, I think we are all having fun in the marketing space right now. Um, um, it, it is a golden period um, because it is fresh. You know, when we when we look at marketing roles as you know whether I'm whether you know Lakshmi as a CMO, okay, you know Pallavi as a brand head out there, Puneet there, or any one of us out there in the room, right? You're basically orchestrating a lot of these things uh, with the hope that you don't fail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so there is no hope of a future, but there is some hope that you should not fail. <laughs> like Pallavi is saying, keep making money for your brands. Yeah, and, and you have to do it very, uh, uh, you, you also need to do it in a, in a manner where, uh, where, where I think uh, scale management is testing all of us. Okay, when I say scale management, scale management of our own ideas, scale management of our own expectations, okay, scale management of our own time not easy okay and simultaneously in in all of this you know you also uh, i was talking to someone else uh, a leading marketer and he said that listen you know i i keep reminding myself that i should not fall into the fomo trap yeah you know in all of this just because i hear a conversation which is happening today you know it should not happen i made a note and next day morning come on guys we need to do this <laughs> yeah so 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 you have to manage manage that part, you have to really just calmly look at your business. You have to look at saying that, okay, this is my marketing strength, this is what I am doing, this is how I am improving. Okay, I don't need to look at peer group. I can be inspired, yeah, but not, not like kind of feel anxious about it. You know, because I feel that the whole market opportunity for any brand, and I just want to add a very interesting point, Rubina, I'll take another minute out here. Um, what is very cool now from a consumer behavior perspective is if is like just imagine that as a consumer today I have let thousands of brands enter my life. So if you see the number of D2C brands out there, okay, or if you go and open your own wardrobe, right? Five years ago, ten years ago, I would probably I'm maybe I'm not a good example, yeah. I would open my wardrobe and there are just three or four brands out there. So my shirts are restricted only to two or three brands at best. You know, and like I said, don't count me as the right example. Yeah. Um, but today when I open my wardrobe, I have 20 brands. Okay, when I go to my kitchen, I open my fridge, there are 50 brands out there. Right? And we are all seeming to be at a place where we are hungry for more. You know, so now you're suddenly saying that the consumer is embracing so many brands. Wow. Yeah, so there is an appetite out there. Okay, so overall the markets, the consumer's appetite to bring brands into their life, the frequency at which the brands they want to indulge with, okay, all that is amplifying. It, it is growing at an infinite scale. Now it's about when all of that is happening, you as a brand custodian are thinking that, you know what, this is an ever increasing market size and I want to capitalize on my market share. That's about it. Yeah, so, so it's a very uh, interesting space from my view. No, actually, I mean, what you said is so true and so real. And building on that, Puneet, I want to move to you and ask you that how do you uh, learn, unlearn every day at MasterCard and how do you make sure you're still in that choice of the consumer when the ch 
Consumers, uh, while they're expanding uh, and opening their doors to many more brands, at the same point becoming more discerning, right? right. So how do you still be part of their lives? So just adding to what Deepak or said. Or will continue to be in the future as well. <laughs> Correct. So the, the, I'm just uh, adding to what Deepak said. So whatever we speak today on the panel uh, may or may not be relevant in the next three or five years, right? Yeah. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that two things which stands the test of time with regards to brand is brand purpose and brand identity. Now, if you look at everything which is available for marketers today, uh, for them to strengthen either brand purpose or brand identity, there are certain tools and trends which every marketer no matter which level in the organization he or she is in, should definitely expose themselves to. I think the first thing is uh, data analytics and AI and ML. The reason I bring this up is because if you look at what machines are able to predict in terms of human patterns and insights, in fact, to a point, how a particular cohort or a consumer segment is going to, what's going to be the next action is mind boggling. So for brands to invest in AI, ML is, is, is almost a mandatory aspect uh, to build and future-proof the brand, so we call it. The second point, which again I want to bring, which again Deepak is an expert on this one, is uh, relevant and humanized interventions in the entire consumer cycle journey uh, uh, through marketing automations uh, is important, but the key, key word here is relevant and humanized. Okay? Uh, the third part, which I, which I was just thinking about before, I mean, we were, we were talking about this panel, is, uh, which is honestly the least spoken about subject, is AR. The reason why I bring this up is because AR is one technology which is ready to use. We have the entire technology to use it across the sales, uh, pre-sales, sales, the consumption cycle, and after sales. And uh, more importantly, I think AR is the first step that brands could take followed by VR and whenever metaverse happens and becomes scalable and executable, right? Uh, again, from a Gen Z point of view, data security and data is an important aspect. They would be attracted and pulled towards brand who understand the, the, the sensitivity of data. And hence, blockchain becomes an integral part in every brand going forward to make sure that Blockchain makes the brand transparent in every engagement, be it transaction, be it conversation, be it engagement. And finally, one thing which I'd like to put forward, which I think, again, adds to the brand future, uh, purely from a consistency perspective, something which Lakshmi and Pallavi spoke about, is the project management tool in your organization, which allows employees within the organization to talk to each other. I think currently, even irrespective of which level of uh, brand today we work in, in India specifically, I think there isn't an open space for employees across functions to converse, uh, to collaborate, to brainstorm, which not only adds to innovation, but more importantly, it, you know, there is a common aligned goal, which is, uh, which is possible through tech tools which are available today. So I think some of these are the aspects put in together, possibly would future-proof your brand. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing that and you know I think what you're trying to say beneath again is like use analytics, use data, use uh, machine learning, algorithms etc. Uh, to understand the segments and perhaps a segment of one and uh, you know drawing back to oh, you Pallavi from where we started off and I want to ask you this question, uh, is it important for brands to still be consistent or be coherent? Uh, as he was talking about that, I was thinking about that because you made that point on consistency. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, the other part is that as a brand, how do you experiment with that flexibility? Because uh, when I started working and when I worked with marketeers, you know, obviously brand is something which is very close to their chest. So how do you allow for experiment and flexibility there, you know? Okay, to answer the latter part first, um, I think a brand, like let's just talk about this entity brand. It becomes a feel-good factor only when the entire working team from top to bottom is sort of satiated with what it communicates, what it does, what it looks like. So like most agencies, it's a practice to involve all the stakeholders before we arrive at something, before we arrive at a potential campaign like Har Ghar Kuch Kehta was an aberration like Lakshmi said, but typically everybody involved in the chain is, um, you know, has something or the other to offer and that kind of contributes to a feel-good and a belief and a conviction from everyone, the entire team working on a brand front. <laughs> Coming to the 
coherence and the consistency part. Well, I've spoken enough about the consistency part because I'm a strong believer in consistency and I think consistency does the magic because if you keep saying something, sales ki language mein bola jata mein, kuch bhi bet sakte ho. If you keep calling something, something else over and over again, people will start believing it and they will buy into it, right? That is consistency after all. Coherence. Now, that's the tricky part. Um, imagine we are a generation who are absolutely adaptable and malleable because we have in a way move from ICQ to WhatsApp, floppy to disk, landlines to mobile, and I don't know what all. And today's, today's market here, particularly at this uh, juncture, in this era, and I can speak for my brand because I sell fitness, we speak to the silvers, we speak to the millennials, and we also speak to the Gen Z. Uh, adaptability comes naturally to us because we have understand, we have undergone that transition, uh, you know, step by step, we've seen the evolution. But along with the evolution, what uh, needs to be done is that responsiveness needs to be very agile. I think Deepak was saying that or Dhruva was saying that. Because you need to work with momentum because it's a very fast changing world. If you don't bring that momentum, if you don't, if that momentum doesn't bring that energy, then in all likelihood you're going to be redundant. So I think as marketeers, what we are constantly doing today is repositioning ourselves some bit every day and also creating a market. Like earlier, it was just one of the two tasks, I feel. But right now, it's become both. And both of these have become a necessity because you have to cre keep growing that market for accommodating the new Gen Z and their needs and the way they look at things. And you have to keep serving the silvers. You have to keep serving the millennials. And, and each of these cohorts, they understand your character. The language evolves. The personalities evolve. But what is constant? for me, for us, is consistency and that character. So I guess that does the trick. I mean, I can speak for my language, uh, my brand again, and um, like fitness is not just a physical fitness. That's the belief that we have been selling, and that's the character of HRX, saying fitness cannot be just a physical phenomena. It has to be mental. It has to be holistic. And the moment you include everything, you become the new age definition of fitness. The physical aspect is going to the silvers, maybe, maybe to the millennials, but Gen Z, Today is interested in e-sport, which is a sport. I mean, you have to cater to that. There is no way I cannot speak that language and I cannot be a part of the e-sport phenomena. Uh, well, NFT is gaining ground. I have to be there to harvest, to talk, to communicate. There's no way I cannot be there. Uh, we're talking about marathons gaining ground. People are coming together in the act of community events. We are doing it. People love walking. I mean, if I come back to the, the 40 demographics, 40 to 50. Well, they are also doing high-intensity high stuff, but let's look at the 60s. They are still walking, so we have to cater to their needs. We have to supply to what they believe fitness is to them. Underlying point being that I am a brand for the everyday athlete. That is something that I don't change. And an everyday athlete is somebody who's waking up and making an effort to get out of bed and get out of home and doing that little bit. So I'm not talking to the podium finisher. I'm not talking to the person who's sort of trying to, um, you know, improve their personal best or uh, sprint their fastest or hit their hardest. But we're talking to the guy who's waking up and making an effort. That is consistent. That is coherent in the messages which go out to people. But the avenues have changed. The personalities have changed. The language has evolved. There is chat GPT also. <laughs> There's everything that needs to be there. I guess that's how we're balancing coherence sure. and consistency today. Sure. And I think it's a tough act. Nobody's got it right, uh, Pallavi. So, and I also believe to manage this consistency and coherency, brand again comes to center stage, right? You have to, like you said, you have to be true to your character and you've said it many times and I can't agree more with you. And Thrupa, I want to ask you this slightly uh, uh, open, and, and I hope you answer it in, with full candor. Given that conversation we've had and what brands are saying here today, do you think brands are enough, uh, investing enough in branding per se? Uh, I will be honest, yes and no. Uh, so, so uh, I think I'll just pick up from where Pallavi was talking about, right? And brands always need to do a lot of legwork, right? And that legwork is, is required because uh, what's happening is at, the, at one side technology is kind of advancing, at the same time consumers' behaviors are changing, right? And what is kind of coming out is the, the consumer's non-linear purchase behavior, uh, omni-channel presence, right? Uh, now, when brands need to do some branding, right, they need to take care of all of these things, right? Uh, consumers are, you know, seeing products online, going and buying on retail stores, vice versa, right? And all of these things will keep happening. So, 
what brands need to ensure is how do they find a right balance out there, right? And, and that's a difficult thing for them to do. A couple of brands are really doing well out there. Then I think we, we always hear think long term, right? When you're building a brand legacy, right? But then also what's happening is CMOs are getting pressures from their, their counterparts in the board meetings and all to get sales, right? And this is where you are, you are doing a lot of campaigns, which are seasonal campaigns, right? Which doesn't leave impression, like probably, and this is what I think Deepak was also talking about. Uh, we have like so many brands out in our life, right? Um, we see so many campaigns which comes during festive season, but we don't remember. This also dial back to Rubin and your point, what you were telling, how many ads I remember from my childhood because option was less and it sticks in my memory. Now brands are in that, that rat race, right? They're trying to reach the same consumer, right? And they're finding it very difficult, right? To create that communication part. So it's again tough job. A uh, uh, couple of brands like which I gave example previously, they're doing some good stuff out there. Uh, so I think that's one thing. Second thing is, I think that's also very important because we're just coming out of pandemic. Purpose-based marketing is something which is gonna stay for long. We have seen some amazing campaigns, uh, which Livewire has done, uh, start of 2022. Hath uh, Hotero campaign, it became viral, but it did deliver that message, right? Uh, one of the one of the campaigns which is also very close to me is a government campaign, Hargar Dastak, which government of India did for vaccination, right? Uh, so these are purpose-driven communications what brands are trying to do, right? And and this will stick stick to consumers, right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, answer is yes and no. There are there are brands who are trying to do out there, but then there are a few brands. You know, I, I think it's a, it's a it's a challenge which they need to figure it out. There are a lot of data, there are a lot of stuffs, but at the end of the day, you need to uh, do with a lot of gut feeling, right? Hey, this way, we are doing it for our brand legacy, right? Okay, I know we are out of time, but I'm going to, huh? A very diplomatic answer. Yeah, I would, I would not take that, but uh, we are out of time, so I'm not going to leave with the point. But I'm going to ask you one last question, Lakshmi, from a brand point of view. What are the challenges that you have convincing internal stakeholders for brand budgets? I'm sure there are plenty, right? Because partners always think that the CMO doesn't want to spend on branding, but I'd love to understand the other point of view as well. <laughs> I think that should be our last closing statement. So, uh, I think uh, for marketeers, it is a brand, and for the rest of the organization, it's an organization. I think the fundamental difference lies there. And of course, you want to invest on the brand, there's no question whatsoever. And of course, you can, you know, onboard people, you know, with their currency, yeah, finance, you talk of whatever EBIT does, or ROC, or whatever you want to kind of work on. Uh, it is not easy to kind of take stakeholders on board. Uh, enrolling them, for example, you know, we spoke so much on digital, right? I mean. It's very difficult, for example, for many of the marketing teams to onboard their legal teams, right? I mean, uh, yeah, it's good to kind of have a 24-hour leeway if you have to release an ad campaign, right? But if you have to respond to a meme, right, you can't do it with 24 hours, yeah? There's no shelf life available to you. So, uh, getting all the stakeholders is not easy, uh, uh, but, but one thing that I've kind of seen and I speak to my friends as well and other firms, Slowly, the organizations have also evolved. I think they understand the language of customer pain, and I think that's the first starting point. And uh, the good part of it is marketeers have also started evolving a lot in their conversations with uh, the rest of the organization. And that includes the board, because you need a larger, you know, we spoke a lot of about brand purpose. Uh, uh, you know, the larger strategy of the brand as such, you onboard as many people as possible, and the more you have them on your side, if they are able to speak the language of the brand, I think uh, uh, you don't need to convince them. It happens. But, uh, 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 but trust me, it's not easy. And, uh, uh, you know, it's always a battle between, uh, you know, how much top line, how much bottom line. And uh, uh, for every investment, where is the attribution? Right? And attribution is one word that, you know, it, it, you know it one gets chased to death uh, with that single word. So, so but yeah, at, at least I'm happy that organizations across the board have evolved to kind of start understanding the value what brand brings on table. I, again, another anecdote. I remember being told once that marketing will always be a cost head. Remember this. <laughs> it will never be a revenue generating stream. So don't ask for too much money. But I guess uh, marketeers have really evolved because I think marketing has now become a combination of the right brain and the left brain. It's become a combination of imagination and intelligence both with data coming in, with analytics coming to the fore. 
it's no more just an art. It's pretty much science. And I'm very, very sure about the fact that it's become very scientific in its approach and so is the marketeers now. It's, it's no more like irrational decisions anywhere. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I know we're totally out of time. I would love to continue this conversation. It was so interesting. Thank you. Uh, you were all very insightful, very honest. And I really had fun. I hope everybody had uh, a good time enjoying this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.